Well, friends, we come to the Word of God this morning. And, and uh, last week, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we began a new mini-series in our study of the book of Ephesians. So we're still studying Ephesians. Um, and I call this series, I it helps if I, I call this series Doctrine Matters. And, and what we're doing is, is, is this. We're, we're going back to the book of Ephesians, and we're highlighting some of the main doctrines that we find there. So, so hence, it's taking a little bit more of a systematic and, and teaching approach as we go through the book. Now, when I first started to do this and lay out an outline for you, I had actually only had three doctrines listed, and that's where I was going to go. But then as I was studying, and, and uh, God kept saying, well, before you do that, you, they need to understand this. And before they understand this, they need to understand that. So, so there's, there's been a few more lessons uh, attached to where I had originally thought that we would go. In, in fact, even my, my wife's going to raise her eyebrows this morning because I, I told her as much as yesterday afternoon what my sermon was about today, and it's actually different. Um, I, I was just not settled in my heart last night with it, and, and the more I, I pondered over it, and uh, God just changed the direction last night. So I, I have to assume then that it is the right direction. Now, I cannot guarantee the delivery or the deliverer, but ultimately it comes from God, and hopefully you'll be blessed by it. Now, obviously, when we look at the book of Ephesians, as I've told you right from the very beginning, the, very, the first three chapters of Ephesians are very doctrinal in nature. And... Uh, um, and the, the last three chapters of the book are very practical in nature. And, and, and so it's obvious that there are doctrines in the book. And the most obvious doctrine is right there in Ephesians 1, chapter 4, and verse 5. Where it's talking about election and predestination. So we're going to get to that, but we're, we're actually going get to get to that last. Um, I think that in the logical course of understanding it, it's best to deal with that last. We need to understand other things before we can get there. Um, another thing that we're going to look at, is, is, uh, which is an obvious doctrine in the book of Ephesians, is uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And again, it's reiterated in chapter 4, beginning of verse 17. And that's the sinfulness of man. And it, it raises the questions, how sinful are we? Uh, and it... it um, and attached to that is, is how far did we fall? And uh, we, Paul actually deals with, with this in, in this book, and it's directly related to the need for election. So we're, we're looking at doctrinal matters, and we are looking at them because doctrine matters. And one of the things I want you to get from this study is that doctrine is important. It is very important. Be, before we started the Sovereign Grace Family Church, we were attending another church. And we had to leave that church because the pastor there told us, this is one of the reasons, but the, the thing that broke the straw of the camel's back, no, the, the thing that broke the camel's, the straw that broke the camel's back. There we go. I'm terrible at my metaphors, aren't I? <clears throat> It's Brianna's fault because I can see how pretty she is. And, and it's just... <laughs> Where were I? Oh, yes. This pastor told us, in all seriousness, he says doctrine isn't important. He, he said that, that we, should, uh, we should never preach any sermon that is longer than 15 or 20 minutes. And it should always be to help people to live their lives better morally. So we are to give them um, little devotional thoughts to help them to live better. In, in fact, he told me that doctrine divides. And that's true. Doctrine does, does, doctrine divides. It divides the things that are true from the things that are false. You know, it, it are in, as Christians, what we say about truth is we say that truth is objective. Okay? We say it is objective versus being subjective. When it's subjective, 
It's I determine truth. Term, truth is founded in my brain. It's what I think is right. That is truth. That's subjective. We don't believe that. We believe the truth is objective. We believe that it exists whether someone believes it or not. So you can go onto the university campuses and you can tell them, am I a six foot um, tall female who weighs 500 pounds? And they'll say, well, if you think it, then you are. Uh, truth exists outside of us. Uh, it, it is beyond you. And, and whether you are alive or dead, whether you think it's true or think it's false, it makes no difference. Because truth is truth. That's what we mean when we say that truth is objective. Not a single person has to believe it, and the whole world can turn against it. Truth is truth no matter what. But you know, then we have this problem in our society. Our society today thinks very differently from that. They don't tolerate intolerance. Think about that for a second. You know, if, if they were to rewrite the Ten Commandments, the, the first commandment would be this, you shall tolerate one another. We, we hear them say things like, like well, that, you, that's your belief. You can believe that if you want, but don't try to force your beliefs on me. Okay? Your beliefs are right for you, but they're not right for me. If we try to impose our belief on them, they, then they say that, that, well, listen, truth is relative and it's subjective. I'm, I'm going to throw out a lot of big words here this morning, but hopefully I'll be able to give you some definition as well. Because, you know, as the church, sometimes we become so isolated within the walls of this building or within the walls of our, of our Christian relationships and our fellowships that we forget that we have a world out there that hasn't a clue what truth is about. Uh, they, they say it's relative and subjective. They say there is no ultimate objective truth that exists outside of our minds. It depends on the perspective of the individual. And if truth is, is relative and subjective, then it cannot be known with any kind of certainty. And what does that do? It leads to skepticism. And that's our whole society today are just so skeptical about everything. They just have no certainty about truth. They say that all truth is in limbo. You can never be certain about anything. And what happens in our society, particularly in our universities, is that it, it develops a, a kind of perspectivism. Uh, that is that no one person or group has a handle on truth. So truth is found in the combined perspectives of many. And you know what? That mindset has come into the church. Someone might say, and I've heard it said, that every denomination is, has part of the truth. So if we want to know the truth, then all we have to do is take some truth from every church, and you'll end up with all truth. In other words, they're saying the Baptists have it right with baptism. The Pentecostals have it right about the Holy Spirit. The Presbyterians have it right about church government. And the Christian Reform have the covenants right. So if we put it all together, now we've got the whole truth. But that's just nonsense. That's, that's known as syn, uh, syncretism. Isn't that a great word? Syncretism. It's the assimilation of differing beliefs and, and practices. They want us to get all along. Let's all get along. Let's just emphasize the things that we, that we all agree on and forget all of the peripherals. Well, the thing is that most of the things that we really disagree on are the essentials of what we need to believe. You know, I mean, you know, while we're at it, we might as well take grace from Christianity and uh, tolerance from Hinduism and maybe liturgy from Roman Catholicism. Then, then we'll have the right church. You see how ridiculous that is? Our, our, you know, even our own interpretations within our own circle of what is truth 
Our own interpretations often are biased by our, our own presuppositions. In fact, you can never come to the scriptures to interpret without a presupposition. The thing is, are you, are you um, um, at the place where if scripture goes against your presupposition, are you willing to change your presupposition? And a lot of people aren't. Especially people who, who, who have built a ministry um, on, on one particular thought, one particular uh, uh, presupposition, and they've written books, and they've sold those books, and they, they're making a lot of money. It's hard for them to change. And, and what we do is, is to, be, to, to synchronize everything is we, we say, well, then, then we need to bring everything together. Therefore, I, I'm, I am right. Therefore, if I am right, then you're wrong. And, and if you're right, then I'm wrong. That's being objective. A cannot equal B, to put it in a philosophical way. And, and what you find, for the most part, is that every Christian church believes that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone, by faith alone. Would you agree with that? Okay. Salvation is through Jesus Christ. We all agree with that? Put up your hand. Yep. Everybody. See that? We're all okay. And, and that's what Paul even says here in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Look at it there. It says, For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. So it's preaching the truth. It's declaring that the truth is salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. And, and outside of the essentials of for salvation, we mostly agree on what, it is, what is essential in order to be orthodox. Now, when we talk about being orthodox, we're not talking about joining the Greek Orthodox Church. We're talking about agreeing with the essentials of early church history, where they fought with the tensions and they wrestled with, with all of the big questions that had to do with with particularly Jesus, his humanity, his deity, but the scriptures, its inerrancy, its inspiration, all of those things, and even justification. And so we have at the heart of what it means to be orthodox are these essential doctrines that we must agree on. And, and then there are those things that are, are important, but not essential. Churches start getting farther in part now as we go out to these essential things. And there are, then, then there are things that, are really, that really are not that important, and they're really just pure speculation. And it is usually the things in speculation um, that differentiate denominations. Um, <clears throat> so these people want us to build truth on speculation that is not that important at all. But the church has also been affected by society, uh, society's thinking in other ways as well. Because on the one hand, where we say that Jesus is the Savior, okay, some churches say that he is not the only Savior. Uh, there are many ways to God that are, that are equally valid to Christianity. This is a disease known as pluralism. Pluralism. So we can all agree that Jesus is the Savior. But we have to say that he's the only Savior. And, and, and some will say that, that uh, salvation is only through Jesus, which is important. But then they'll turn around and say, but Jesus is revealed in other religions in different ways. That's like saying that, that Islam worships the same God that we worship. He just has a different name. That's a disease known as inclusivism. Is doctrine important? Yes, doctrine matters. It is important. Well, let's just take a look at some of the Bible verses to make sure that we understand that. Uh, in John chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus said this. He said, my teaching, and, and the word teaching there can also be translated doctrine. So my doctrine is not mine, 
but his who sent me. And who sent Jesus? The Father sent Jesus. So what's he saying? The doctrine, the truth, the teaching that he taught belongs to God the Father. If doctrine belongs to God, then how important is it? Very important. Uh, one day the Pharisees complained to Jesus that his disciples were not keeping their traditions. Uh, they had added some 400 to 600 uh, rules and regulations that were meant to teach the people how to keep the, the commandments. But the problem was is, is that they taught them as though those things were equal to the law of God. And Jesus told them that their traditions, in fact, this is what he, he said, he said, they made void the word of God. Their false doctrine brought harm to the true doctrine of God, and it made it so that the people couldn't worship God properly. It, it, listen, this is Matthew 15, verses 6 to 9. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. See how important it is? Not only is doctrine come from God, and truth comes from God, but when we have the right truth, when we teach the right truth, when we know correct doctrine, it helps us to be better worshipers. When Paul sent Timothy to take care of the church of Ephesus, this is what he cautioned him in 1 Timothy 4, 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You see, God was teaching Timothy that there are two things that had to be done. He had to live the right kind of life and teach the right kind of doctrine. This scripture also teaches that doctrine plays an important part in our salvation and our sanctification. Well, the Apostle Paul said, I appeal to you in Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. And Hebrews 39 warns, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, strange doctrines. And when we were looking at our enemy as we were going through the, the armor in Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, in our little mini-mini series there on our defeated foe, remember we, we talked about the Antichrist from 1 John? What is the en essential description of an Antichrist? They're, they're, yeah, they teach false doctrine. They teach false doctrine. Particularly doctrines about Christ being God himself is, is deity. And, and when we allow false doctrine in, it disrupts the unity of the church. And what is the only way to, to identify false doctrine? By knowing what? By knowing true doctrine. See how important it is? Even in the book of, of Ephesians, right in the middle of the section on the mission and the mission of the church. Let's take a look at those verses in chapter 4, verses 11 to 14. Right, right there, it, it, talking about the mission it, and the mission and the ministry of the church, Paul talks about the importance of teaching doctrine through discipleship. Look at verse 11. He says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Teachers teach doctrine, teach truth. Teaching truth builds, uh, equips the, the saints for ministry, and that builds up the body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all, t all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And verse 13 is really is all about evangelism, and verse 14 is about um, discipleship. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. 
And, and the, deceitful, the deceitful schemes belong to whom? Who? Antichrist? Yeah, but more particular than that, go to chapter 6, verse 12, verse 11. The devil. Okay, that's one of the verses that you had to memorize. He put on the whole armor of, whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, you see. When one of his schemes is obviously attacking us through false doctrine. Right doctrine keeps you safe then from false teaching, from the schemes of the devil that, that cause you to sin, and it makes you a better worshiper. Let, look at verse 15 of chapter 4. Speaking the truth, that's doctrine, in love, we what? We what? We grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together. And what are we joined and held together? By every joint with which it is, what's that next word? Equipped. What is that? That's the teaching. That's the doctrine, the truth of God's word. That acts like a, a joint that holds us together. And when each part is working properly, what happens? It makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in, in love. You see how important doctrine is? In Christ and in love, joined and held together uh, by true doctrine, the body grows in love, in love with one another and in love with God. We read Psalm 139. What was it all about? It was about, about God's eternality. It was the fact that God existed from before time. It was the fact that God saw that, that David before he was ever even conceived in his mother's womb. It's the fact that God had a sovereign plan all mapped out that would, for David when he was finally born. It was all of these things about God. And what was his response? God, you're so awesome. Our God is an awesome God. Doctrine teaches us about God. When God reveals himself to us, we worship him, and we do everything. This is the emphasis of one, of that whole first section in chapter 1, verses 3 down to 12. Okay, what does it do? To the praise of God of his glory. L last week, we, we asked the question, why did God create man in the first place? We, we saw this picture. We took a real quick picture of the sinfulness of man, of the fallenness of man. We, we even looked at, at uh, our own sinfulness as the redeemed and the forgiven adopted sons. But here's what we discovered. We discovered that the reason God created man in the first place was because he is a creating God. That's who he is. Okay? And, and the reason for everything then must be found in who God is. It is a revelation of God. That's what the scriptures is. So God did not create us. He did not create man because he needed us or even wanted us for that matter, but simply because he created someone to reveal himself to. He wanted us to know him. And when, what do we do when we know him? As soon as we learn something about God, all we can do is worship him. And we praise him. And we wonder in awe at his greatness. That's what it means when I say that doctrine matters. Let me give you four more reasons why doctrine matters. And then hopefully I'll be able to explain to you why I've done it this way, and you'll understand. Number one, sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on a specific message. Our faith is based on a specific message. See, the, the overall teaching of the church contains many elements. Yeah, there's lots of things. If we were to, to look, look at a systematic theology, and by the way, I think you should all buy one. Uh, I think a good one is uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. Uh, although I don't agree with everything that he does on the lesser important 
topics, but uh, on the essentials, he's right on. Okay? Uh, and everybody should have one. But the, the overall teaching, then, the, the primary message is very explicit in the Scriptures. And, and I think we need to see this. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 3. Well, let's start at verse 1. Now, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. And verse 4, the end of verse 4, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. You see, our, our, we have a specific message that needs to be learned and taught and, and, um, and preached, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is kind of clear-cut, and it's, it's a clear-cut good news. And it is, look, look at what it says there in, in uh, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of, what? First what? Importance. He, he's saying this message of the gospel is important, but it's not just important. It is first importance. It is the most important message that we have. And sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on a specific message, the message that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. That's the specific, clear-cut good news of the Gospel. You change that message, and the basis of faith shifts from Christ to something else. Our eternal destiny depends upon hearing truth. Flip back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. I love how Paul has woven all of these things throughout the, the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Okay? Talking about hearing the word of truth. Look at what he says. He says, in him you also, speaking there of the Gentile believers, when you, what? heard. You see, we have an essential message that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again from the dead. And when you heard this, and look at how it describes it, the word of what? The word of truth. This is doctrine, my friends. The essential doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the word of truth that must be preached and when people hear it, people can be what? People can be saved. And that's what he says, the gospel of your salvation when you believed in him. There's another verse that goes with this. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just flip there. Philippians, Colossians, uh, Timothy, or Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you, that's the same thought as Ephesians 1.4, God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in what? Belief in the truth. So sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on a specific method, message. That message needs to be believed. That message is truth. The second, then, the second reason why doctrine is so important, sound doctrine is important because what we believe affects what we do. What we believe affects what we do. Right? And, and, and I've talked to you about this on many occasions. Behavior is an extension of theology. And there is a direct and there's a direct correlation between 
what we think and how we act. Okay? What we think affects how we act. We noted that the first three chapters of Ephesians are, are more doctrinal in nature, and the latter three chapters are more about our conduct. So we move even in the book of Ephesians from exposition to exhortation, from doctrine to duty, from creed to conduct, from orthodoxy to orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is what we believe, and orthopraxy is how we live. And when we learn theology, it turns into doxology. So it affects the way we live. It affects the way we relate to God. It affects the way we relate to one another. It affects the way we relate to the world. Anybody tells you that doctrine is not important, don't listen to them. And Paul's intention is that the manner in which we live corresponds to what we say we believe. So we're exhorted in chapter 4, verse 1, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. The calling is the doctrine. But the manner in which we are to live is the response. And, and verse 4, chapter 3 tells us that we are to be eager to maintain the unity by means of the Spirit. This is the unity that comes through our faith in Christ that unites us together as one body in Christ. That we are one in Christ, and therefore we need to be one in the church. Doctrine affects the way we live. And I think probably the most obvious is chapter 6, verse 4. It's a particular message to the fathers. Hey. Okay? Remember when we looked at this on Father's Day last year? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Remember how I, we defined the word provoke? It's not making your children angry. It's not teasing them the way some people talk about it. I mean, fathers, you do need to be careful about teasing. I get myself in trouble teasing all the time. But that's what I was talking about here. It's talking about about exasperating your child has to do with being provoked because of the inconsistency of your life to what you say you believe. That's what provokes your children. If you say you believe this, but you live your life as though you don't believe it, your children have every right to be angry and provoked. So it's a tremendous warning to us. Another example of this, and, and uh, in fact, when, when Berna was a little girl, um, she went to Massey Hall in Toronto, and uh, watching the, um, the the play of Peter Pan, and she was an old, enamored by the truth of this. That she, that as a little girl, how old were you, Bern? Four. Uh, she was four years old. She she believed that she could fly. What did she do? She climbed up on the railing of the balcony so that she could fly. Her mother caught her and told her, no, that's not true. You cannot fly. So I, I mean, that's the same thing. Two people are standing on the top of a bridge, and one believes he can fly, and the other believes he cannot fly. Uh, their actions are going to be dissimilar. You see what I'm saying? Doctrine affects the way we live. What you believe affects how you live your life. In the same way, a man who believes that there's no such thing as right and wrong will naturally behave differently than the man who believes in a well-defined moral, uh, moral standard. In, in, in fact, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 10, Paul lists there a, a whole list of, of different sins. Um, sins like rebellion, murder, lying, and slave trading. They're, they're all mentioned in those verses. But he concludes with this line, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Whatever is contrary to sound doctrine is sin. In, in other words, true teaching promotes righteousness. Sin flourishes where sound doctrine is opposed. So in that church where the pastor said to me, doctrine divides, it's, you don't need doctrine, you just need to teach moral things. He doesn't realize that you teach morality without doctrine, they'll never change. They'll never 
change. Third reason. <clears throat> Sound doctrine is important because we must ascertain truth in a world of falsehood. We must ascertain truth in a world of falsehood. So for those taking notes, our faith is based on a specific message. Number one, what we believe affects what we do. Number two, number three, we must ascertain truth in a world of falsehood. 1 John 4.1 says this, Many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's lots of, lots of philosophies out there. Lots of different teaching. All you got to do is turn on um, Vision TV or what's, what's the other one? I was going to say TSN, but that's not. Maybe the sports network teaches false doctrine too. I don't know. <laughs> Trinity Broadcasting, TBS. Man. Jesus talked about it in the parable of the, of the wheat and tares, that there are tares among the wheat and there's wolves among the flocks. The best way to distinguish truth from falsehood is to know what the truth is. To know what the truth is. Well, the fourth reason... Sound doctrine is important because it encourages believers. It encourages believers. In Psalm 119, which is the longest of all of the Psalms, which is all about the Word of God for the most part, in verse 165 it says there that those who love God's Word find great peace. Find great peace. And it's true. You ever found that in your own experience, that, that when, 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 when things in your life seem to be in turmoil, that all you got to do is read the book? And the truth of God's Word brings peace. If you were to look at my Bible, and, and let's say particularly the book of Ephesians here, you'll see that the, the, because we've been studying it now for almost a year, that uh, my pages in Ephesians are quite mangled. And there's writing all over it. In fact, there's, there's spots where you can barely read this, the text because of all of the writing that is there. And, and, and I, can read, I can read Ephesians, and I read Ephesians, and I hear every single message I preached on the book. This is the same with the chart that we handed out last week, the chart of Ephesians. I look at that, and, and I can hear every message that I preached. And I tell you, when I when I am in struggling, and you know what, I, you might want to pray for me this week because ever since I preached that message on prayer two weeks ago, man, God is working in my heart, and I, I'm going through a real, true spiritual struggle in terms of, of prayer, and particularly prayer in preparation of my message, and, and prayer as, as your pastor, and uh, and I've been really convicted that that I don't pray enough. And, and I find, this, 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 especially when the week gets going along and starting to get closer to Sunday and the stress starts to build, I, I, in my own human time, my hum, humanity is, I don't pray. I pray less. But God is trying to teach me that I need to pray more. And I think that's why I've been struggling so much is because until he teaches me this lesson, or at least until I learn the lesson he's teaching me, um, I'm going to continue the struggle. But see, God's word brings us peace when we know the truth. Titus chapter 1 verse 9 it says that a pastor must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it pastor encourages others by sound doctrine. And that's what I hope will happen when we continue on through this. So the question I want to ask you this morning is, is how do we come to know truth? How do we come to know truth? Do you remember what Pilate asked Jesus when he was stood before him on the day of his execution? Pilate asked him, what is truth? How do we answer that question? 
Our answer has to be that God is truth. Remember I said the truth, we believe that truth is objective. It's outside of ourselves. But when we put it outside of ourselves, we have to put it somewhere. So we've studied this book, and this book has clearly declared itself to be the Word of God. And that God, as the creator of the universe, has a, created us to reveal himself to us. Therefore, we need to know this. When we learn and study doctrine, it encourages us. So the question, uh, um, so God is the, God is truth. Truth is centered in God. Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And John 14, 6, what did Jesus say? I am what? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now there's a truthful statement. How does that truth affect our lives? You see, when, when we learn that, that no one comes to the Father except through Christ, and we have placed our faith and trust in Christ, what does that mean? That we are able to go to the the Father. And that encourages us. In the whole Old Testament, nobody could go to God. Nobody could stand before him except one man on one day. Yet because Jesus Christ died for our sins, was rose, r- r- risen from the dead according to the scriptures, and we have placed our faith and trust in him, we have access to the Father. What a comfort in all of our situations of trouble, in all of our trials, in all of our stresses, and all those things, we can can calm ourselves. We can go to the Father. We can go to His Word and read it, be comforted. We can go to Him directly in prayer and be comforted. When theologians talk about Christian epistemology, now there's a word for you. (laughs) That's a fun one. Epistemology. Epistemology is the study of truth. Where does it come from? What is it? When we talk about Christian epistemology, Christian learning truth, we, we believe in what is known as in what is known as the correspondence view of truth. Which says this two things. One, truth is an objective reality that exists whether someone believes it or not. And two, that objective reality is grounded in an eternal God. That's what we believe. And and we believe that truth, therefore, can be known because God created us to make himself known to us. And in making himself known to us, we become true worshipers of God. You know, the, the key model of society today is truth cannot be known. Truth cannot be known. And we're telling the world that truth can be known. It's given to us in the God's Word. And, and this is an essential in understanding evangelism. Before we begin to lead people uh, to the truth of Jesus Christ, we just may have to lead them to the truth of truth. And, and that is where the battle lines are today. Society's moving in an Uh, toward an aggressive attack on truth. So if Christianity stands or falls on objective truth that exists outside of ourselves, then we must learn how to deal with it. We must know how to defend our truth. Well, let me run you through a bunch of verses here in Ephesians very quickly that sort of set the direction and the tone of where we're going and why I've chosen to do it this way. I didn't teach you anything really new this morning, did I? Right? I mean, mean, you're all Christians. If I said to you, what is truth? You would say, God is truth. If I said to you, where do we find truth? You would say, in the Bible. Okay, that's objective truth. That's true. I didn't teach you anything more. Uh, if I had asked you the question, do you think the doctrine is important? You might have hummed and hawed a little bit and said, yeah, yeah, it's really important. If I s- s- 
broke it down even farther and said to you, well, should I teach doctrine in terms of sermon preaching? You might say, mm. well, maybe teaching doctrine isn't really from the pulpit, um, but it is essential. You see, and, and one of the things that we identified a couple weeks ago is that what's really one of the other things besides a prayer meeting, although I think I've found a solution to that in that we're taking time in the morning to pray. And I think that gives us a better prayer meeting than most churches because the church is here. How many people show up to a prayer meeting on Wednesday night in most churches? A handful. We had a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. How many of you might show up? A handful. On Sunday morning, if we have prayer time together, you're here. Where was I going? Um, where was I going? Oh, yeah. We, we, one of the other things that we're really lacking here is a time of in-depth Bible study. And um, I've determined that we might seeking God on this, that one of the things that we have to do is, is that until we have Bible study somewhere else, uh, and another point in time that I have to take time sometimes to do in-depth study from this point of view. So that's what today's message is. I mean, it's not exegetical in terms of we're taking a passage and we're running it through and finding out what God is saying. But the truth of what I'm teaching you is just as relevant. So when I say to you, should pastors teach when they preach? Or should they just preach when they preach? There are, time, there are times for teaching. Well, look, look at, you know, keeping in mind again from last week where we're, we're stepping out that God created us to reveal himself to us so that we may know him and in knowing him um, we become better worshipers of him. Look at chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 1, 17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, this is Paul's prayer, his first prayer, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. You see, when we read, read the Bible, it, it's, not in, it's not inspiration. God's not giving us new truth. Okay? Uh, uh, um, it's illumination uh, of the things that he has already re revealed in his words, but it's revelation in the knowledge of him. We need to know who God is, and he wants us to know his will. Look at chapter 1, verse 9. Verse 9, it says, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose that he has set forth. Well, you know, that not only does he have a will that we want to find out and know, but it also teaches us that God himself is a volitional being. He, 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 um, he set his will in Christ before the foundation of the world, it tells us. He planned Christ's incarnation and death and resurrection and ascension in eternity past. That is when, we, when uh, he purposed his will to redeem the elect. The mystery of his will to save us, that it, save is that it was his will to save Jews and Gentiles, people from every nation. He wants us to know the hope that we have and the riches of in, our inheritance. Look at 1 verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What is the riches of the glorious inheritance? He wants us to know his love, chapter 3, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. We, we, we know these things through the Holy Spirit by studying his word. Um, chapter 3, verse 5, which was not made known to the sons of men um, in, in other generations. In other words, he's saying that, that this whole revelation of the gospel going to the Gentiles was not revealed to the prophets of old, but it has been revealed to us. And... Uh, and God wants us to learn and understand and to know him. Ephesians 3.3, 3, to, kn to know how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. The spirit and the word. Okay? The, the, um, the sixth piece of the armor of, the, of God. So important. A and even in evangelism. A and so what is it saying? It, it says that we need to have a love for God's word. We have, need to have a love for learning. Um, we, we, we need to have a love for learning doctrine. 
Sometimes it's dry. Sometimes it's boring. There's lots of big words like I gave you today. Tons of big words. But you know, they help us to know how our world is thinking as opposed to us. That helps us to be able to evangelize better. Because now we know what their, their real need is. We need to teach them the truth of truth before we teach them the truth of Christ. We, we, it, it teaches us how to, to worship. When we, when we learn the truth of, of, of election, of predestination, when we learn the truth of God's eternality, of his sovereignty, then all of a sudden all of our life comes into perspective because it falls within the plan of God. And that causes us to be better worshipers of him. The knowledge of God and his glory is the highest goal of everything that God wills. That's what we have to know. So we're going to pick this up next time. Not next Sunday. Next Sunday is Communion Sunday. And reminder again, we have the fellowship lunch afterwards. Um, ne- next Sunday, I, I, I want us to focus in. I want to bring a message that focuses in on the cross. So, so we're going to s- sort of bypass Ephesians here. But then we're going to come back to it. So, so through the three Sundays in May, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the image of God. So we're going to look at some key attributes of God that are necessary for us to know in terms of understanding the doctrine, particularly of election and the fallenness of men. But, so we're going to look at some attributes of God, the image of God. Then the next week, we're going to look at created in the image of God. In other words, God created us in the image of God. What does that mean? We need to know what that means in order to know the third week, which is fallen from the image of God. What did we lose? Did we lose all of the image of God? Did we only lose part of the image of God? Um, did we um, lose some and not others? Uh, and, and how does that affect us? What does that mean in terms of our salvation? Uh, what does it mean in, in terms of our lostness? And how far have we fallen? So the image of God created in the image of God and then fallen from the image of God. So that's where we're going to go. And, and I hope that I've enticed you to, to, um, to fall in love all the more with doctrine, with the theology that turns to um, doxology, to praise of our Lord. So that's what we're going to do now as Jeremy and the music team come and lead us in our last hymn. We're, we're going to sing How Great Thou Art. Again, it focuses on, on God as the creator of the universe and uh, helps us to, to reflect on seeing the beauty of creation to seeing who God is. And when we see God, what do we do? We worship Him better. <laughs>